Hi everybody, Mr. Olson here. Uh, today we're going to talk about chemical reactions and enzyme activity, which can be found in Chapter 2, Section 4 of your textbook and Chapter 2, Section 5. And uh, let's go ahead and kind of open this up and move pretty quickly. Chemical reactions are basically going to be uh, when we have substances changing from one form to another form. They might even change what substance is actually there. Um, basically, we're breaking apart bonds between atoms or we're forming new bonds. Uh, and they can come in a lot of different ways and shapes. Uh, down here, you can see the reaction of, let's say, um, baking soda and vinegar. It's like a little acid-base reaction. And it creates the foam, you know, the bubbles that kind of um, boil up. Um, over here, um, you can see in this region right there, number two, um, we can see um, oxidation. Uh, basically, you know it as rust, uh, a rather slow process. And of course, uh, big exciting things can happen happen too, we can get things like a thermite reaction, uh, which is a lot of energy being released all at once uh, and very cool to watch. Reactants are going to be the things that take place in a chemical reaction. Uh, basically, they're going to be the things that work together to cause the, the chemical reaction. On our example that we have up here on the screen, we have CH4, methane, and uh, two O2 molecules, which are, is just oxygen gas. Uh, when they mix together and they experience a chemical reaction, uh, we're going to create two new substances. Um, just try to keep in mind, and I've highlighted it in red for you here, the left side of every chemical reaction, um, really every chemical equation, that's what we'd call this, uh, these letters and numbers down here. We call that a chemical... Um, sorry, chemical formula. It's kind of like the recipe for making something new in chemistry. Uh, in our chemical formula here, we are gonna see that uh, these two things, the left side, are always gonna be the reactants. On the next slide, we will see that the right side is always going to equate to the products or the things that are made by the chemical reaction. Um, now, the truth is we could have just picked this up and swapped them around. So our blue and our reds uh, just could have moved to different sides and we could have had a similar reaction. We could have split apart carbon dioxide and water into um, methane gas and oxygen gas. The point is you should always direct your attention towards these arrows, okay? The arrows always point to the direction of what they make. Um, and the arrow just means yields, which means it creates, it makes, gives way to. Uh, so just try to keep in mind, left side reactants, right side products. So there's something out there called bond energy, and you'll remember on some of the previous um, uh, videos or, or notes that we, we talked about, we said um, bonds will form. We have covalent bonds, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds. And what we're really going to be looking to break are going to be a lot of those covalent bonds because a lot of the times the covalent bonds are just going to be sharing of electrons. And that's going to be pretty common and very strong. Now, there is a certain amount of energy that's required to break those bonds. They can break. Uh, the little uh, chart that you see down here, it just kind of represents some, some figures out there to show you like how hydrogen or carbon or nitrogen bonds uh, with other uh, atoms and how much energy um, it would actually take for that to break apart. Um, you don't have to memorize any of those numbers, but I do want you to recognize some bonds have more energy um, required to use it to break or more energy is required to make it break and then some need less. So equilibrium is when you have products and reactants formed at the same rate. Um, and I just wanna to mention to you, like on our previous slide, we can kind of have things go back and forth and maintain a certain shape, a certain look, and the same substances are gonna be both produced and broken down at the same rate. Now here's this concept with activation energy. Now we're gonna be seeing a lot of graphs, a lot of charts and all these notes here, but try to stick with me, okay? Um, all chemical reactions need some amount of energy in order to even start. They don't just magically happen. You have to add energy to it so those uh, bonds that are getting broken or getting formed can actually begin. Uh, we call this activation energy. Think of it kind of like the amount of energy you need to start a car, right? Every car needs a battery. Um, and if it's a, a you know a petroleum or, or fuel-based vehicle, um, there's got to be like a little spark. Well, you don't just generate the spark out of nowhere. That's the purpose of the battery. So when you turn your key or turn on your engine, however you do that with a button or something, um, 
It's going to make that little spark, which can help ignite that gas, causing a much larger reaction, hopefully moving your car. Now the activation energy is seen over here in our little graph here, and you can see that term, activation energy, is used over here and over here. Now you can see our little graph here starts, both the red line and the blue line starts right here at the same region. And over time, and that's what's going to be uh, down here on the bottom over um, time, we are going to see um, that there's things called enzymes, uh, and you can have reactions with or without enzymes, sometimes called catalysts, which we'll talk about very shortly. But I just want you to see from your starting point, which is this uh, dotted line down here at the bottom, to basically the uh, the peak amount of energy that is required is going to be considered the amount of activation energy. And of course, that can vary depending on what you have available. So let's talk more about that. I also want to mention to you there are um, different kinds of reactions you can have. Um, after we start our reactions, you can either absorb or release energy. Um, I know these terms seem a little funny, but they're they're pretty much well, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. They mean the same thing. Um, on the blue side here, we can see we have an endothermic reaction. Um, an endothermic is sometimes called a endergonic reaction. And basically the idea is this. You start off with your reactants. You start off with your value. That's your base value. And then number one here will equal the activation energy. Okay. And number two is going to show us how much energy um, is actually going to be held there. Um, and we can see that we actually are ending. Our products are going to have much more energy held within than when they began. This is going to be uh, endothermic, which means it's going to absorb energy. It's going to hold from here to here all that extra energy. Basically, this means we'll see the temperature decrease. It'll seem to absorb energy, hold it inside of it, and things will get colder. Think like an ice pack. Um, then we have an exothermic reaction. Exothermic are sometimes called exergonic reactions. Just try to keep in mind, exo means exit, therm means heat, so heat is exiting. Um, and we can start off here now, and we will see our reactants, um, and that value of one, that'll be our activation energy. Um, that's not, We don't need as much in this case. We're going to reach this top peak here, and then we will release energy. You will see that our energy is now being lost. Um, and that gap for number two is going to show us how much energy is actually lost. Um, our products will end much lower than our reactants when we uh, started off our reaction here. And this is going to actually come off as heat. You will feel it. Um, so try to keep in mind those those prefixes, those those key words that we find as part of these uh, these terms here. Endo means like enter, enter or into. Therm means heat. So endothermic means heat is entering, which means it's going to cool down. It's going to pull it from around it. And then exothermic would mean heat is being released, uh, and you're going to feel the heat because it's being released. Now, let's talk about a very big concept. Uh, enzymes are absolutely essential to understand. We're going to be doing a lab on these here in my class, um, and it's going to get kind of gross, but also kind of fun. And you'll be able to see chemical reactions happen uh, inside of living things, inside of your body all the time. So let's talk about it. So there's this term called catalysts, and catalysts are basically substances that decrease the amount of energy you need to start a chemical reaction. So this, this graph here should look a lot uh, very familiar because we basically saw something just like it earlier. Um, and basically what we're trying to say is we lower activation energy, okay? We're basically saying you don't have to have as much energy at the beginning to get the same result in the end. So in our small graph that we have right here, we can see we have our reactants A and B, right? And A and B are going to use a bunch of energy if, if they, we don't give them anything special. They just have to use a bunch of energy in order to, um, you know, form a new bond and create the new molecule called AB. But if we do use an enzyme, and by the way, this means no catalyst, Okay, if we do use a catalyst, notice how much lower it is. We don't need as much energy, so that it means it does have a catalyst. 
and we still create the exact same product in the end. So we can take the same reactants and receive the same products with less energy. That's just genius. Thank you, body. You, you've saved me so much energy. I could use that energy to go do other things or maybe have the same reaction in another instance. And this can help me with digestion. This can help me with filtering out bad stuff out of my body, uh, especially in your liver or your kidneys. Um, and this is just really good for digestion overall. So a very cool thing are catalysts. Now in biology, we know them as a different name. And that name is going to be an enzyme. Now enzymes are just a biological catalyst that, that are used for speeding up reaction rates. Basically what we're saying is we can make this reaction, this transformation of molecules happen much more quickly and more efficiently. Um, and they also try, tightly control those chemical reactions so they don't just go crazy and just cause a small explosion to happen inside of your stomach. Um, this is really good because there's only so many of these catalysts, so many of these enzymes that are floating around inside of you at any given time. And this means that your body's going to be able to handle um, only so much of that reaction at a time so it doesn't just run away. Um, we can see a little graph right here. We can see the rate of reaction and the temperature. And we can see that temperature is one of those things that is going to affect enzymes. Um, you have a dotted line here, the optimal rate, uh, which is just going to be below um, 50 degrees Celsius. Now, uh, I just want to let you know, we can also see on the right side of this graph, it shows us what percentage of the enzyme is active. Um, we get to pretty close to 100%, uh, I'd say probably around 80%, 75%, uh, just looking at the peak of our, of our parabola here. Um, and we can see that its optimal rate is just below that 50, 50 degrees Celsius. Um, what does this show us? Well, it just shows us that they operate in a certain range. If we go just past 50, um, we start to see that enzyme activity greatly reduces um, and it's not being used very well or even earlier um, in colder temperatures um, it's not very reactive it doesn't do a very good job so enzymes are very delicate they need to maintain a certain condition in order to be efficient and be you know and use their energy the way they're supposed to I really like this diagram because it kind of shows us uh, that idea of um, energy being lost or gained and it shows us what it looks like with the enzyme. So this big ugly blue molecule over here, that's going to be our actual enzyme and the things that um, we're trying to uh, form new bonds with, that's what we call substrates. Now the enzymes and the substrates are going to be separated at the beginning. But if we want to bring them together um, and let's say we bring them together um, you know, on this side of the molecule, what can happen is we don't use very much energy at all for it to happen. The enzyme saves us that trouble. And the cool thing is um, after that reaction, we can see we form our new product, the red piece there, and the enzyme stays intact, which means we can reuse it again for another chemical reaction. If we didn't have the enzyme at all, we'd have to use all of this energy to let something happen, which would be um, terribly inconvenient. It would it'd be kind of terrible if you ate an apple and it stayed inside of your stomach, you know, most of the day. Um, we'd like to process that more quickly, get it into our intestines so we can start digesting it, putting it into our blood and using its pieces and parts to help us survive. So once again, simple reminder, simple graph. If we do use an enzyme, we save um, basically our energy um, by using that enzyme. If we don't use that enzyme, we're going to have to spend a lot more money, a lot more energy um, in order to create the same products that we'd want. So it's just smarter to use an enzyme. If you want to, imagine this. Um, pretend these aren't just parabolas on a graph. Pretend this is a hill in front of the school that you have to go over um, before you come to school in the morning. Would you rather go over a steep hill or would you rather go over a very small hill? Well, of course, you'd choose the smaller hill because you'd have to use less energy to make that process work. If you had to go over the big hill, you're going to use a lot of energy just to get to the same place. Why would you want to do that? No fun. Enzymes are going to be made up of those molecules that we talked about previously called proteins, um, which remember are um, what we call polypeptide bonds between amino acids, which are um, various different kinds of molecules that link together and they form these very complex structures of proteins. Now these proteins now have special um, faces, fa uh, special sites, they're called active sites, that allow these substrates, these pieces, these reactants to stick to and break off uh, so we can actually speed up those chemical reactions. 
Now, um, of course, enzymes can be affected from doing its job by a few factors. Um, pH, if there's too much of an acid or too much of a base, um, they're not going to work well because enzymes are biological catalysts, which means they work in living things. If you have too much of an acid or a base in your body, these probably aren't going to be very effective, which is very important to remember, especially when it comes to our lab that we'll try out. Also, temperature can affect how they work. If it's too cold or too hot, um, they're not going to work out too well. They can What they do is they, they can end up denaturing, which means they break up uh, and they, they don't get repaired after that. Um, and then concentration. Of course, how much of the enzyme you have will speed up or slow down the reaction. If you just have a few of those enzymes, um, they might be working over, over time, but they're not going to work quickly enough for something to happen. If you have too much, well, it might quickly flare up and then it'll just calm down because it's already done the job for all the substrates that were available. Um, they usually function best around body temperature, which, are, which is around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees in Fahrenheit. Um, and the cool thing is, they can break hydrogen bonds uh, if the temperature is too high, if it's slightly higher than what we'd expect of that. Um, this means like fevers and heat stroke, overheating, are considered really, really dangerous because those hydrogen bonds aren't terribly strong and they like to maintain a certain temperature. So if we suddenly change that, um, we, can, we can become terribly, terribly ill, if not um, irreparably damaged. I also want to mention to you, um, we see... Uh, things like uh, like uh, pH and temperature and concentration, uh, they're, they're really going to be the things that we're going to be studying when it comes to that lab for enzyme activity. So try to understand that if you do have um, a big change in pH or a big change in temperature or a big change in concentration, you're not going to see as much enzyme activity. So enzyme and structure is actually going to be really important because it controls how those chemical reactions occur. Uh, I mentioned earlier how um, each enzyme contains that feature called an active site. And that's what our little diagram down here shows us. It has a very particular shape. The enzymes, they're proteins. They're big, ugly, folded up, complex looking molecules. Um, and there's like a little pocket, a little hole that's designed for a particular substrate to fit in there. Um, if we had another substrate, Substrate, let's say it looked like this, it's not going to fit in the active site the same way as our green substrate here, which means you need a particular enzyme for every particular piece that you have, every particular substrate. Um, once they lock together, they form that enzyme substrate complex, which basically means it's more of that complete shape, and then the chemical reactions can occur the way they're supposed to. Um, also, I should mention that uh, there is a key that we use for this, a description of this called the lock and key model. Um, and it shows how the characteristics of how um, special enzymes are and how they can only fit with particular substrates, like on this diagram here. So you can see that we have a, um, a very interesting looking substrate, kind of a U shape and a, and a triangle shape, uh, and they're designed to fit on one particular enzyme's active site. Um, and you can see in diagram now number two, um, we form that enz enzyme substrate complex and they fit together very nicely. It's, it's very cozy, it's happy. Once that happens, we, we form that, um, that complex will now have those uh, chemical reactions that are so important and our products are produced. And once our products are produced, they can be broken off and they can fly off and do whatever job they need to do. Um, and once they do that, um, the enzyme is still left behind so it can get reused. Um, once again, enzymes are pretty much a permanent feature of your body unless we do something to break them down. Once again, pH swings, uh, temperature swings, concentration swings can really affect enzyme activity. And if we destroy the protein, we destroy the enzyme through temperature or pH, um, of course, they will not recover. So um, that's pretty much everything for enzymes, ca um, catalysts, as well as talking about chemical reactions. If you have any questions, let me know in class and uh, have a great day.